Our final Thank guest you. this morning is Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, a Republican from Washington State and the ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Welcome, Congresswoman. Very soon that won't be ranking member. That's right. Right. And so yeah, tell us call what's. Me chair. Yeah, Madam Chair. So, <laughs> Madam Chair elect or Madam Chair to be. Um, Tell me what you're going to do in the front end on the question of energy security. And I also want to say that you've been very active, you know, talking about Texas, talking about various ways in which we need to improve uh, energy infrastructure smartly. There's now money to do it. How do we do it right? Well, that's, that's going to be our goal. Make sure that America is leading. America is blessed with abundant energy resources. And we've also led in the, the innovation and the technology that is going to lead the way, not only for meeting our energy needs here and doing it in a reliable, affordable way, but also leading the way for the world. And so I'm, I'm just really excited about continuing to build upon um, the strong foundation uh, certainly, energy is important to everything that we do. It's our, right. it's, it's, it's our national security, it's our economy, it's our standard of living. And so uh, uh, American leadership matters, and we just need to continue to lead the way. We need to unleash American energy, continue to lead in bringing down carbon emissions, and uh, unleash new innovation and technology. So you are a big proponent of grid resiliency. Are you surprised after your many years in Congress that, we're, that America has to talk about its grid? Like, I mean, when you go to South Korea, it has an active grid. It's got, you know, everyone connected on the Internet. I just find it sometimes humbling to think that we, don't ha we have crumbling infrastructure. And so Texas got cold. You were very active talking mm -hmm. about, you know, Texas's uh, dependence, and they have a full spectrum energy side. Mm -hmm. What are we missing? What's the deficit in the investments that we're making when it comes to grid resilience from your perspective? Well, I think uh, resilient, uh, resilient grid, making sure that we have reliability is, it's foundational, obviously, but we're putting more demands on the grid all the time. And so it's, it is making sure that we are investing in that energy infrastructure. I think sometimes we take for granted, you know, that our, our infrastructure is strong and it is safe. And, and, and yet you, you So that at, sounds arrogant. Arrogant. Well, I think we just got to make sure that we're not that, not of you being arrogant, but of our, our our confidence being arrogant. Well, and I think it's important that we keep keep investing in the grid. That we just you know we we're putting more demands on it, and so uh, when it comes to our our electric grid, uh, and there's the projections are pretty. Uh, you know, it's going to be significant increases in demand on the grid. And so uh, I think it just, uh, we got to be, we got to be taking those steps now to make sure that we have so, the reliability. Madam Chairman, you know, one of the questions I have, I just, I just posed it to Jim Himes, who was mm -hmm. here, is a lot of the shell casing of the spending and infrastructure and investment, the Inflation Reduction Act that the Biden administration has been doing has been around the climate dimensions as opposed to the security dimensions mm -hmm. or the security of supply or cybersecurity side of this. It, are you, when, when the Republicans take control of the House, does the shaping of investment need to move away from being focused? I mean, you just mentioned reducing carbon emissions, mm -hmm. but for, the, for your broader caucus, is it going to be more successful to move from the climate rationale to the security rationale? We, we have to do both, right? I don't think it's an either or. And that's mm. where energy, as I was saying, is foundational to everything. It is our national security. And, and my goodness, well, with uh, Putin's aggression in Ukraine, people in Ukraine living without mm. heat or electricity right now. I mean, this is real. And the importance of us having security, uh, a secure grid is foundational to our national security, but it's all, and there's more attacks as we're, uh, we're putting more right. devices and more demands on the grid. It just, it means that there's more opportunities for the bad guys to also attack the grid and we're, and whether it's a physical attack or a cyber attack, there's, there's, you know, it, it, there's more vulnerabilities and that's why it's important. But it's also, you think about our economy, our competitiveness, uh, making sure that we have reliable, affordable energy and that our grid is uh, able to meet all those demands. It's just, uh, it, it needs to be all, it so, needs to be both. So part of that picture is the nuclear picture. And it's very interesting to me that we don't make most of our own nuclear fuel needs for our nuclear reactors. We import that nuclear fuel from other providers. Some of them are allies. And guess what? Some of them are not. About 20% of our nuclear fuel needs comes from Russia. Do you think we need to reverse that and begin um, reinvesting in nuclear fuel making capacity in the United States? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I'm very excited. That's three yeses, four yeses. Yes, okay. <laughs> another one. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, America ingenuity has led the way in so many 
uh, historically, advanced nuclear reactors, the next generation technology for nuclear uh, power is exciting in being able to meet our needs and uh, the advancements in recycling the fuel, the waste, so that we, we are addressing one of the biggest concerns with nuclear. But yes, we are, yeah, but we need highly enriched uranium. And right now, uh, we, are, we get too much of that from Russia, and it is a damper on our ability to continue to lead in the small nuclear reactors, the advanced nuclear reactors, and this is one example, but unfortunately it's repeated. Uh, so, so, yeah, we, don't, we, we used to mine uranium in my district. Hmm. We don't do that anymore. Uh, you rich, enriched uranium, that is... Uh, is, it, is there still is, some there to be mined? Well, uh, they're focusing on the cleanup right now, but uh, uh, you know, I the cleanup of the mine, uh, right, which is part of the process. But you know, I I don't know if they're the invest. We used to do a lot of mining in my district. We used right. to mine gold, silver, lead, magnesium. All those sure. mines have shut down in just the last couple of decades. And 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 when I talk to those that were doing the mining, it would just became cost prohibitive, you know, so they went to other countries around the world. Uh -huh. Now America is realizing that we have shut down mining access to critical strategic minerals in the United States uh -huh. and become dangerously dependent upon other countries. And so on uh, advanced nuclear, on yeah. uh, enriched uranium, yeah, we, we need to, I believe we need right. to look at this question and, uh, and, and look at what it's going to take to Tell, be able to do the mining and the process. I mean, when we've talked before, one of the things I really enjoy about our conversations is you have a really good feel. You go spend time with your constituents. I'm not to say that all of your members don't do that, but some do it more than others, and you talk to them. Do they have, you were just talking about the weaponization of energy by Russia and what's going on in the world. And, and what that has meant for Eastern Europe is I, I just returned from Slovakia mm -hmm. and met foreign ministers. Very tense, right? So oh, yeah. the energy needs, the energy prices, you know, 10 times spike in provision of energy in some of these Eastern European states. And I'm just wondering whether Americans, one, feel the sense of crisis right now over Ukraine and Russia and what's happened with energy and it being fungible. And do they feel like the transition costs we're making right now in this moment are worth it? Or do they feel that those prices that we're having to pay to essentially have a proxy conflict with Russia and Ukraine are not worth it to them. Where, where, what's the psyche of your constituent right now on this? There's, there's overall concern about rising costs. Right. But they, they see it at the gas pump. Mm -hmm. They're, we're heading into winter. Spokane is having, we have, we're, it's a winter wonderland. We're, right. We've had lots of snow. It's cold. We're not a, a expected to go above 32 degrees for next 10 days at least, you know, so it's cold and people see it mm. reflected in the, the in cost the of heating their homes. It's, it's real. And mm. especially for the lower, lower income, it, it hits them the hardest. I, I think that what is happening in Europe is really a clarion call to the United States of America that we really need to pay attention. And, and to your point, the Eastern European Union or the Eastern U U EU uh, countries, okay. as well as Ukraine, uh, I was there, it's been several years ago, but they were, they were begging us for liquefied natural gas, send over some, you know, we, we, we don't want to be dependent upon Putin, President Putin, for uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline or getting our supply from Russia. And as far as the people in eastern Washington, I think there's, yeah, there's, there, more are paying attention. It, it has... It has brought it home, the reality of how foundational energy is and that you can't take for granted, you know, it, kind of where we started. We have to keep investing in energy infrastructure to make sure that we have reliable, affordable, right. and continue to bring down carbon emissions and lead the world. Have you been surprised that the um, permitting bill that Senator Manchin drafted and that drafted by Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Now, there may be others out there, but those are the two I'm most familiar with. Haven't found a middle somewhere. Because when you look at it, the GOP has wanted permitting reform so deeply, so long, yes. so persistently. Um, and I understand all the frustration with Joe Manchin and the IRA, but you know, fundamentally, it was out there. And then you had Nancy Pelosi, and you had Joe Biden, and Chuck Schumer, on board with a permitting thing, which is not a normal characteristic of their political slant. Yes. Are you missing, is the GOP missing a unique opportunity to have had the leading 
Democratic leaders on a major permitting reform bill? Well, the Democrats tried to do it alone. Uh, that, that doesn't usually work out very well for either party. Yeah. I, th I believe there, there is a, a growing recognition. There was a, there was a moment, mm. certainly when Senator Manchin was making this a, a key issue for the Inflation Reduction mm. Act. There's right. a, there, there is a growing recognition, as you just highlighted, across the board, across the ideological spectrum, that we need to address permitting in the United States of America. And it's not, and we can... Up, continue to uphold our high environmental standards, highest, right. uh, yeah. cleanest water, cleanest air, yeah. you know, most countries around the world. We've led the world. And what we need in permitting is certainty. Mm. There, and there needs to be, uh, we need to address how long it takes to do anything in the United States. And right. there's a growing recognition, whether you want to build a solar farm mm. uh, or, you know, build a nuclear plant, it takes way too long. It mm. takes years, decades in some cases, and all of that means more cost, and it makes it difficult, if not impossible, mm -hmm. to do anything. And when it comes to energy infrastructure and uh, investing in the energy infrastructure of the future, we, we must address permitting. I, I think it's the single biggest barrier to us uh, being able to really move forward right now to do anything. So do you think that regardless of whether it passes in these next couple of weeks in some forms, that it's going to remain a high priority in some way? Yes. And that the, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I've, you've, you're, 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 an, you're, you're a deal maker. You, you talk to people across the aisle. You get things done. But the question is, a lot of folks out there that may be wrongly typecasting the incoming House look at the House as um, you know, the GOP-controlled house is one that may not work across the aisle as, as much as may need. I'm not sure that that's true. The question is, on permitting, will it be an area where they try and change the dimensions and really make this a priority? Because I agree with you that I'm allowed to have opinions in my former journalist, that, that, I, that I, I find it one of the elements that's missing in the portfolio of America's energy competitiveness, right? So is it going to remain a high priority in, under your Absolutely. Tenure? It's been a long-time priority for the Republicans. We have, uh, for as long as I've been in Congress, I have been advocating for permitting reform. I come from Washington State. We are, we're 70 percent hydropower. There's right. hydropower in every state in the union. We could double hydropower mm -hmm. without building a new dam simply by, you know, uh, only 3 percent of the dams produce electricity. So we convert them. And it's clean, renewable, reliable. But the permitting, it takes 10 years on average to relicense a dam. Mm. That's, that's way too long. And that's, that's repeated over and over and over in every sector. So uh, we're, we, as the incoming chair of Energy and Commerce, yeah. I am excited to go to work on this. You in sound a, very and, excited. And, and, yeah. and, and, and to find the, the, the bipartisan uh, agreement. We all want to uphold those high environmental standards. Uh, but I, I, have, I, I chaired a task force to modernize NEPA several Congresses right. ago. I know that we can do it without and uphold the high standards, but actually get get decisions, make get things done. And Garrett Graves on our side of the on uh, Republican lead, who's been very active on this issue, uh, he has the Builder Act. That's one that I would commend to people, and and we will. The Energy right. and Commerce Committee is a committee at the forefront of. Of energy security and and energy and uh, unleashing American energy and and we're going to look for finding the common ground. Uh, we're going to work on behalf of the people. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. And real finally, real quickly, I'm going to open the floor just for a couple of minutes. Is the um, is the cyber side of this? I was talking mm -hmm. to Jim Himes, and he was just honest, I think, and candid that the literacy among his colleagues is not where it needs to be mm -hmm. on the fragility in the system when it comes to cyber. Yes. You know, when you are chair of the committee, are there things to, you know, do some teach-ins, uh, yes. bring your, yes. uh, uh, mem you know, members along and, and their staff member to kind of enhance the literacy level of the fragility that we have out there, the ransomware attacks, the malware. We had Tom Fanning from Southern Company here speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, this sort of constant siege that many of our leading energy companies are under mm -hmm. is something I think most of the public would be horrified if they knew. Right. Um, and many of them are watching live now. But what, what do you think we need to do by way of literacy of the legislative side of the uh, cyber response? We need to do more education, have some hearings around what the, the growing threat around cyber attacks 
uh, are, uh. And, and on the Energy and Commerce Committee, we're at the forefront of energy, health care, right. more attacks uh, on health care, hospital systems, medical records, telecommunications, technology. Uh, and I believe that it's important that we address it sector by sector where the experts, uh, those that are at, on the front lines, uh, have the opportunity to come in and tell us what, they, what they're what they experiencing mm -hmm. and what they believe. And this will be a big priority for you yes. and, your, and your folks. It's our, it's our future. Thank you very much. Let me open the floor. Questions from the floor? Okay, right here. Oh. Uh, Kami Cam, Butt. All right. All right. I mean, make it good. Uh, yes, Congresswoman, uh, I'm from Pakistan, and the largest dam in Pakistan, Mangla and Tarbela Dam, they were built by American dollars, basically, like 40, 50 years ago. So Democrat blamed that Republicans don't want investment in the country. Uh, your hesitation uh, and your saying that it costs so much and it takes so long, does it justify Democrat argument that Republicans don't want to invest in their own country? Thanks. Well, the Republicans would very much like to invest. Uh, the well, Republicans... They, they talk yeah. about deficit, and they, 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 they want to say that, oh, we shouldn't make future generation in debt by spending, spending, spending. Well, the Republicans believe that money alone will not solve these problems, uh, that we have to address the permitting side of, of projects. Um, so... The, the Republicans believe that if we are going to mine, if we're going to manufacture, if we're going to invest in uh, infrastructure, transmission, you name it, we have to address the permitting and the regulatory climate in this country right. that, is, that is hampering us from doing anything. It takes years. I just mentioned a hydro project, 10 years on average to relicense a project. Uh, you know, it's decades for, you know, so the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was established in 1975. We have not permitted a where, single, yeah. a single yeah. plant from start to finish since 1975 in the United States of America, okay? Highway projects, on average, seven years, any federal dollars, seven years to permit a, a federal high, highway project. The Republicans believe that we, we can and we must do better. And it's not about lowering standards. It is about actually getting putting the money in the most efficient way to actually get projects completed that we're spending years and, you know, well, lots well, since, and since lots you're, of money. You're, you're talking right. about fiscal mm -hmm. responsibility and fiscal, you, where are you on this upcoming question, which we'll have to deal with in this next year on debt ceiling and what sort of terms should we have about raising debt ceiling and, and should there be commitments made on, you know, significant large tectonic reductions in other forms of spending? Stay tuned. <laughs> Debt ceiling. There, is it going to be fun? It's going to be fun. It's going to keep me up it's late? Gonna, it's going to keep you on the edge okay. of your seat. But I, I do want to mention, yeah. you know, I, I think yeah. maybe pivoting from debt ceiling to um, back, I'll just point out the CHIPS bill. Yeah. The CHIPS bill that was passed. And, I, and you supported that? I, I did not in the oh, end. Okay. Because, and I had supported oh. a, 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 sm a smaller version of it. Right. Anyway, but there was no changes to the permitting, the regulatory climate in this country. And now what are they facing? What are they coming and telling us? The very people, the investors who want to get these plants in the United States is that right. uh, we, need some, we need some exemptions from the permitting requirements because it's going to take too many years to get these plants built. So that's, that's where and had yes. you anticipated that problem yes. when you opposed the bill? You were worried oh, that we yes. would have and that I problem. Oh, yes, and I'd had several conversations uh. with Secretary Armando, Commerce Secretary, and she, she was, she's, was going to work right. on that. She, she recognizes that we need to address the permitting, and I, and I want to work with her further. But again, that was a, it, it was a missed opportunity. It, it, it is an example where just throwing more money at a problem mm -hmm. isn't going to to solve it unless and there we was so much it. demand to get that chips act through that it would have been an opportunity to potentially absolutely oh uh, we have one last question okay. question right here uh, th thank you congressman uh blake johnson with the bipartisan policy center yes. you mentioned that um conservatives are always worried about the, the amount of time it takes to get these yes. plants built and everything else senator uh mcconnell mentioned the transmission issue was one of the key things yes. as to why they weren't going to participate that's a state's issue yes. um that also takes a lot of time yes. to right. coordinate how will you address that issue 
we're going to have to go to work on it. Okay. So I, and I don't have, I, I know that that is one of the big uh, questions that needs to be answered. Um, but there are, so, there were, I think, legitimate concerns raised by the states that would be impacted in the, in the, in the current proposal around the permitting reforms on transmission that the states, uh, you know, some states would benefit, some states wouldn't and cost and such. So we'll, we'll have to look at that closer, but the goal is going to be to address the time uh, that it takes and to get some permitting reform that is desperately needed in our country. So we hope you stay warm during your holidays in Spokane and, the, and, and your district that's uh, below 32 degrees out that's there and that you send pictures because some yeah. of us really like snow. Oh, I do too. Uh, and, I do and, too. You know, okay, I'm going to go skiing. I'll yeah, send, so, you, send, send, send some, some photos of the Mount snow and, right. and stay warm. And yes. I just want to thank you so much for your candor this morning. The incoming uh, chair of the Energy, Commerce, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, Kathy Morris Rogers, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank really you. great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. That brings us to the end of our program this morning. On behalf of the Hill and the Bipartisan Policy Center, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us here today, whether you're in the room or online. If you missed any portion of today's discussion, the full event video will be available on thehill.com shortly. Um, if you're here in person, we're not kicking you out. We have a lunch spread out here. I invite you to stay and enjoy. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.